Hi, everyone, and welcome to the special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and the Love Is Podcast with our co-host and host of the Love Is Podcast, Kim Sorrell. Kim, how are you? And you know me and then loving entertainment and talking about it because entertainment is my life. Former professional wrestler, all these things. Cannot wait to talk. And I know, Kim, as I've exposed you to the celebrity world in this past year, you're excited about talking to our guests. I am indeed excited about talking to our guest, Gregory Orr, who just happens to be, first of all, an incredible guy in your own right. Like the things that you've done, what you do, the genius from starting from sweeping floors or whatever your beginnings, your humble beginning to where you are today and directing and writing and the things that you do. And uh, you also happen to be the grandson of Jack Warner, Warner Brothers, who is uh, so well known. And um, and then this documentary that you made is just incredible that shows your grandfather that it's got to be just this whole different feeling of not just this person. I mean, it's big enough, right, Jack Warner, but that he's your grandfather. Uh, so how did this come to be? Can you talk to us about it? Yes. Uh, Jack Warner, I knew his grandpa Jack growing up. He was actually my step-grandfather. Uh, my grandmother married him when my mother was a little girl, was nine years old. But he was my grandfather. I grew up with him. I went up to their nine-acre estate in Beverly Hills as a kid. You couldn't just show up there. You had to make a reservation because there was a studio guard at the gate. And it was a special occasion to go up there. But uh, I knew him growing up. My father worked for him at Warner Brothers as uh, an assistant and then head of television. My mother had been an actress at Warner Brothers, just starting off in her career. She's in a, in a little movie called Casablanca, her first film role when she was 17, playing a young girl from uh, Bulgaria who goes to Bogart asking for help. And uh, so I knew these stories, but always from the studio side, uh, from my family side. And uh, I always had an interest in film and worked in film for many years, doing different jobs, including sweeping the floor of a special effects company that was making the Pillsbury Doughboy commercial. I like to say I was the Pillsbury Doughboy dresser uh, starting in my career. But when my grandfather died in 1978 and then my grandmother died in 1990, I knew a way of life, a unique slice of a classic golden age Hollywood was disappearing. That house, that beautiful nine acre estate they were living in was going to be sold. And all the contents were going to be sold at auction. The new owner, David Geffen, uh, the producer and, and record maker and mogul himself, uh, wanted to buy it. And my aunt was handling the sale. He wanted to buy it with everything in it. Oh. Uh, that included the Oscars, which uh, he didn't get those. But he got just about everything else. And... Uh, he was a very shrewd businessman. You know, he was putting down a lot of money and he wanted to be able to sell off some of this stuff uh, and make a little money back. And he did. He sold a bunch of things to Warner Brothers for, I think, maybe $3 million, you know, so mementos and souvenirs and scripts that were bound. So I knew I had a matter of weeks to really go up there and just um, uh, document it, just photograph. And I grabbed a friend of mine who had a camera, video camera, and we went up for a couple of days and just shot stuff, not knowing what to do with it. And out of that came the idea of let's make a little movie about the house and their life. And then that grew into a larger movie, a biography of Jack Warner and Warner Brothers Studios and, and the four brothers who founded Warner Brothers. And being involved to do this, it's got to be an honor, right, to be part of this project, to look back in that it's way. It's funny. When I, when I think about, you know, what is your heritage, uh, the, the lineage, you know, everyone's given something by their parents or grandparents, even if it's nothing. There are people who, who get nothing from their families and have to, that's what launches them in the world. I was given a tremendous amount, but it didn't necessarily help me in my own career directly. Being Jack Warner's grandson did not, surprisingly, did not get me jobs. Uh, it was from a past generation. There were new people in place, obviously, but it did give me this rich history, which I had to sort through in a lot of ways and my feelings about, about him and the effect he had on my family and the industry uh, at large. And uh, that's partly what the film was about. I mean, it's very much a look at him. It's, it's, a, it's not that much about me. It's a little bit about my memories of the house, but it's mostly about him. So it was a way to sort out my own feelings and discover who he was beyond the, the stories around the dinner table. Yeah, that's interesting because there are a lot of stories around the dinner table, right? I mean, you know, he was known as being a pretty funny guy, 
but a pretty tough guy at the same time. And sort of, it, it seems like people either loved him or hated him or both at the same time. And he had a way of attracting the best of the best of the best when it came to um, actors and and producers, directors, the people that he worked with. So when you hear all these stories about your grandpa, about the like, the dislike, the good, the bad, the ugly, the whatever, how does it play into what you know about your grandpa, how you saw your grandpa? Well, definitely, as a, like I think a lot of kids, you hear the family stories, you have a certain image of your parents or grandparents or that crazy uncle uh, who went off somewhere and married a Tahitian. But, uh, you know, as you get older, you have to start you start seeing it or you, you should be able to see it through, as, through adult eyes. And I had all this, uh, you know, research available to me, all this material if I wanted to go into the archives and obviously watch the movies or interview various people for the film who had worked with them, uh, who knew him as friends. So I got a more nuanced picture of a guy who, you know, grew up pretty poor. I mean, they were struggling, they were working, but the the parents didn't have much money in Youngstown, Ohio, at a butcher shop and a bicycle shop at some point. And, you know, the brothers, uh, the four brothers and Jack was the youngest, they want they want to be businessmen, so they opened up a bowling alley. They opened up anything they could, any kind of small business they could, and eventually they found their way to an early movie projector in 1904, and they got into the movie business at the beginning of a craze. People just went to the, to see anything move. It was such a you know there was no nothing else like it in your life. Uh, you had phonographs. You obviously had some live stage shows, but sometimes those were expensive, so movies were cheap. Nickelodeons are called that for a reason. They cost five cents. And you go in and see some little short film of something going on. And it, it whetted the appetite. And my brother saw this, like, this could be a great business. So they got in on the ground floor uh, with a movie theater and then a film exchange showing all this. So these are all things I discovered that I heard the headlines about these and a few stories, but never really the business side. And I think the business side is a fascinating side of, of the movie business, of, of their development. Warner Brothers rise from you know, poverty to becoming one of the preeminent, preeminent uh, studios in the world. And they're just celebrating their 100th anniversary right now. That's right. awesome to think about. We think about brands. How did they grow that brand? How do they visionize that brand? You think about the McDonald's brothers who helped the whole process of that brand of McDonald's almost that same time period in that development. To, you know, you know, Ray Kroc, how he grew it to McDonald's today. But what do you think? We, we speak about brands that, you know, surpass time, 100 years, and it's going to be on forever, Warner Brothers. What do you think made that brand so special? Well, first, I'd say a, a commitment to adapt. That they got in, uh, they had different names for themselves. They were incorporated as Warner Brothers Pictures in 1923. So that's when it became the company that we know today. But before then, they struggled to do... Um, you know, other kinds of businesses. And the thing they figured out, Harry Warner, the oldest, was a very shrewd businessman. And he, I'm told, I never met him. I'm told he could sell anything to anybody. So he was the one who was going and getting, <clears throat> excuse me, he was the one going out and getting money. He made sure he talked to who, whatever backers, investors, bankers, he made sure they had enough money to keep their operation, even though they often were on the verge of bankruptcy. And their first little movie company was closed down. They had to sell off to Thomas Edison's trust. Thomas Edison made a claim since he invented the movie camera, not the projector, but the movie camera, that everybody had to pay him who wanted to make a movie or show a movie, pay him some royalty. And people hated this. And he finally squeezed them out. They, he wanted too much money and they couldn't afford. They, they had to get out from the, the U.S. government finally broke that up and said, you can make a movie without having to pay Thomas Edison. But their Brandon, they learned from the ground up what their audiences wanted because they had these two little movie theaters. And so they saw the audience come in, what they liked. They also came from that very population, often an immigrant population. Their, their father had come from Poland. And the older brothers had been born in Poland. Jack was born in Canada uh, when the father was up there. But um, so they were very close to the audience. And as they grew, they grew the business. It was very important to them to acquire otherwise, you know, because there were hundreds or thousands of people doing the same thing they were doing. Starting off with a little Nickelodeon or maybe have a film exchange where you bicycle film prints around, you rent them to other theaters and you're sort of the middleman between the producers and the theater. And uh, 
that they kept going and they they finally acquired some other film exchanges and they just kept growing because they had the resources to do it. Uh, that was an important, I realized that was an important component that get backing, get financial backing for your plans. Yeah, you know, uh, I think I read that they started with like $150 to get and they the, had to scrape it oh, together. Yeah. They had to scrape it together to get that oh, first I'm projector. Sure. Yeah, yeah. You're right. So here it's brothers, and and uh, not all brothers get along. <laughs> and there are many brothers that go into business together and dissolve it before too long. But they they hung in there for a while. What was the dynamic between the brothers? They, were, I think, of the Beatles or something as a band. You know, like they were like a band. And they all had unique skills. Uh, Harry being the oldest was a financial and business wizard. Uh, the next oldest was Albert, who was very quiet. He was not a showman in any way, but he was the treasurer and very honest. And his handshake meant something to people. And so they trusted him. Then there was Sam Warner, who was really the one who was the gadget guy and the, the man who got them into the movie business. He discovered this projector, this, this new form of entertainment and got the, his brothers into it. And he was always tinkering around with what's the next step in movie making, movie development, and eventually got them to sound pictures. He's the one who helped push for sound uh, in 1927. And then there was Jack, little kid Jack, who when they first started was a 12 year old uh, coming from Youngstown on the trolley to their first movie theater in Newcastle, Newcastle Pennsylvania. And uh, one of his job was to clear out the audience by getting up in between shows and singing. Because one of the problems was people would just stay and watch the show over again. And they wanted to clear it out for the next audience. And he'd get there and he'd stand up and sing and sing badly, he claimed. And supposedly that would chase out people. So he was really the, the you know, he was the problematic younger brother who was always getting into some kind of trouble, mischief, and tagged along. So he wasn't really prepared to be the leader of the company. And later in 1956, in a deal that people thought was a betrayal, um, he uh, was there when the brothers decided to sell their shares to a syndicate of bankers, and he bought his shares back, and the syndicate of bankers made him president of the company. So suddenly he was the lone Warner Brothers. But in between that time, it was very much competition between them, but also cooperation, tremendous cooperation uh, to make mm -hmm. the movies. And you know, the older brother gave sort of the moral stance and the financial stance that we should make movies that educate and entertain and inspire. And Jack had to deal with the studio and all the actors and getting the right people and making it happen out in Burbank, California, at the, at the studio lots that we know today. So why The Last Mogul? Why did you the title La The Last Mogul? Well, he outlived his contemporaries who ran studios. Uh, Louis B. Mayers, Walt Disney uh, had passed away, um, uh, uh, Sam Goldwyn, uh, all the ones who had started off in the early, the Zookers of Paramount. So he, and they called him moguls. It's actually a word he hated. He said, I'm not some Indian prince, you know? <laughs> so, but it, it seemed to fit. And someone has called uh, Lou Wasserman of Universal a mogul. In some ways he certainly was. He was more of a tycoon because he didn't actually make movies. He was a, you know, a, he ran Universal and was had been an agent, was a, a, an important player. So I just thought the last mogul had a certain, wistfulness to it also that a time had passed uh and that's the way i viewed it and maybe the title would would reflect the view of the film an age gone yeah i read a quote from i believe from you that i love that you talk about you said um uh you wanted to bring the personalities to life basically is what it sounded like and take them and not just handprints on a sidewalk but they were real people doing real things and the beginning of what we all enjoy. I mean, look at where we come with streaming services. And I mean, the movies that that were made early on, even at Warner Brothers, are still being shown. And so the legacy just lives on and on and on, which I don't know anybody who's not passionate, who doesn't love movies and, and television and cartoons. And because Warner Brothers did it all. And so there's this passion behind it too. And there's just, a, what an incredible legacy you have. Like how fun and what a wonderful tribute to your family, not just your grandpa, but really your whole family. And uh, I admire you for that because it, it took a lot of work to put this together. 
I don't know how many people are in it, but there are a lot. You got a lot of quotes from a lot of people. How did that work for you to get all that? Well, it was interesting because the two families were separate. When, once the, uh, Sam died in 1927, working himself to death, getting the jazz singer, the first talking movie up on the screen. And a day or two before it's premiering in New York, he dies uh, back in Los Angeles. And all the brothers actually rush to his bedside and are not there when that movie premieres in New York. So that's sort of a, that's a very much a tragic story. So there's really three brothers from that point on, and Jack and Harry do not get along. Jack Jack wants to do things his own way. He he's a very different personality from Harry. He's very solid businessman and moral, and married to the same woman for fifty years. Jack ends up divorcing his first wife, has an affair with the woman who becomes his second wife, who is my grandmother, and the family doesn't like that and doesn't really treat her that well. So there's a lot of animosity, yet they work together. Um, so for me, I didn't know the uh, the other side of the family, the Harry Warners uh, side of the family. I never met them until I reached out in making this film and talked to his granddaughter and met his met her mother, met Harry's daughter, and started getting some um, some material from them too, and just branching out from the much smaller world I had growing up into a Bigger and Sam Warner's widow is in the uh, is in the film. She was there when all this happened. She'd been a young actress, and she can talk about what it was like and what Sam was like. And it was just great to have people who were there on the ground. Now I made the film in 1993 originally, and in all this time, I said this is this is my first documentary. It could be better, and I got to go back to it at some point. There's more material that could go in it. And in these 30 years, I really thought about it and prepared it. And then when Warner Brothers announced their 100th anniversary for this year, I said, now is the time to do it. Don't wait any longer. So I got all the new material, all the clips from Warner Brothers. They allowed me, they charged me a little bit, but they allowed me to take everything in high definition and 4K, the photos and up-res, what they say, up-res the, the interviews so they're pristine and new score, new soundtrack, and really made a, a movie that hopefully could, could last for another 30 years at least, or another 100 years, as a great insight into a time that has that has gone. Because you can't get those people back. They've all, most of them have died. And uh, so I, I really wanted that to be preserved and to keep them alive. I feel a little guilty in some way. It's, it's like my family album that I'm forcing onto the public. Like here, look at my family <laughs> pictures. <awesome. laughs> but because they happen to be that family, there, there might be some interest in it. Uh, but oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's a little way to keep them alive. For a moment. Now, yeah. So Kim has a love question to talk about. I, you can see your passion and love for the story. Look at Kim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, uh, I dedicated a year, Gregory, to figuring out the true meaning of love because there always seems to be this mystery, right? Like if you put five people in a room, you get five different definitions and um, it's sung about it's there. It's in movies all the time, you know, whatever. But uh, but what is love really? So I dedicated this year to figure it out. And I did. I figured it out. And uh, so I'm always curious, like where love plays a role, where your love for for family, for for what you do, um, where where does love fit into it all for you? Well, I'll tell you how I came to love the movies. And I do think love has a lot to do with a selfless appreciation of the other or of something. It's not so much about you because there's that kind of love. People say, I'm in love and I'm enamored of somebody, but it really has so much to do with what can somebody give you or something give you. I fell in love with movies, not by going to the, to, to the movies in a movie theater, but by being able to visit Warner Brothers as a kid and watch them make movies. And I, I couldn't go very often, but I could sit on that soundstage and watch them make movies all day long. And that was a sense of watching them work together for common interest, which is to make that scene come off really well. All those people gathered around uh, and beyond the camera, I don't know if people realize this, that when you're making a movie, all the lights and everything are, and the focus is on the actors in the scene. But on a soundstage, it's all fairly somewhat dim and dark beyond that. So there's this pool of light that everyone is focused on and bringing equipment to and helping and costumes and so forth. And it was just a great, it's it's almost a holy tableau in a way of of effort or in this light uh, for the what's going to be put in, put on the camera and I just I, I fell in love with that 
And I wanted to do that in my life is to gather people together and uh, preserve or to uh, make a, a, you know, a fiction narrative or a documentary in that light. And that's that, what it was for me. That's fabulous. Where can people watch the film? What's the best Thanks. place? Yeah. Thanks for asking. It's available on video on demand right now from Amazon and iTunes and, and YouTube and Vimeo and so forth uh, on demand also through cable platforms. And it eventually, so you have to pay a few dollars to rent it. But so if you're eager, go, please go, go to it. It helps me. But uh, if you wait some months, it'll eventually be on uh, uh, turn, uh, turn to classic movies and other platforms, you know, streaming platforms that you have a, a subscription to. Well, I want to encourage people to buy it because it's a fun movie to watch. It's not just this documentary, you know, some people think documentary and, and their eyes glaze over, right? But this is a fun, fun movie to watch. You did an excellent job with it. Thank you for bringing it to the world, Gregory. Thank you. I did want to entertain people while, while a little bit of education in there. So I'm oh, glad to hear fantastic. that. Thank you. Appreciate it, guys. All right, guys. That was the special simulcast of the Neil Haley Show and the Love is Podcast. Take care.